The moon, our nearest celestial neighbor, has intrigued and inspired us since the dawn of humanity. During the Apollo program, 12 astronauts landed on its cold and cratered surface, but they couldn't stay. Now, NASA's Constellation program begins a new journey to live and work on the moon, setting the stage for future long-duration human exploration. Today, two spacecraft scouts are poised to lift off together aboard a powerful Atlas V rocket on the first launch of this new era. They are the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and the Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite, or LRO and LCROSS. One rocket, one destination, two critical missions. Together, they're helping us pave the way back to the moon. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, George Diller. I'm here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida, inside the Apollo Saturn V Center. Behind me is an actual massive 363-foot-long Saturn V rocket, just like those that boosted the Apollo astronauts on America's first human missions to the moon. Today, NASA is preparing to return to the moon, beginning with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and the Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite. This upcoming launch aboard an Atlas V rocket is the critical first step in the new Constellation program. On today's show, we're going to take you inside both of these exciting missions and find out what it takes to launch two spacecraft at once. Our first guest is Kathy Petty, Deputy Project Manager for the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. She stopped by the NASA Direct Studio to give us the inside story on this moon mapping mission. Uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Project, or, or LRO's main goal is uh, we're really the, the first mission, the first step uh, that NASA is taking back to exploring our universe. And so what we really need to do is uh, have a reconnaissance mission, you know, get, get more data. Uh, one of the things that we want to do is, is go back to the moon. Uh, you know, we've been there before. We, we have uh, really awesome data sets from our, our previous missions from the Apollo era to the, to the other spacecraft that have gone. So we want to build upon those data sets that we already have. And, and most of those data sets really focused on the equatorial region of the moon. So now we want to go back and say, hey, um, let's map the entire moon. So, so have more of a global perspective or a comprehensive atlas of the moon and uh, help whoever wants to, to join us in exploring our universe or, 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 or taking that next step back, they need to have uh, a more comprehensive atlas of the moon so that they know where to go, what to do, what to expect, that kind of thing, help them out. We're, we're like a scout mission for the, for the exploration. Well, well, roughly a couple of days after we, we launch, we will begin uh, what we call the lunar orbit insertion burn. And, and that burn will help us, uh, or help the moon and us, uh, get captured by the moon. And so what, what happens during that burn uh, is LRO starts to get closer to the moon and the moon will, will capture LRO. And once, once, once we have that confirmation that the moon has captured us, we call that lunar acquisition. And then after we have lunar acquisition for, and we, we're sure that we have a stable orbit, then we will begin a series of burns that are roughly uh, a day apart from each other, a series of four or five burns that begin to lower LRO into her final orbit, which is roughly 50 kilometers above the moon, or 31 miles. And that's LRO's polar orbiting orbit where, where we lower the spacecraft low enough so that, so that the instruments can focus on the surface of the moon and begin the data collection that, that is what our mission is all about to create that comprehensive atlas of the moon. Now, an interesting offshoot of our data is that our data will also be made available to Google Moon so that anyone uh, that has access to the web or Google will be able to punch in uh, I don't know, like Shackleton Crater and be able to see all the cool data from LRO pop up right on their, their own personal computers at home. Well, at NASA, we're all about exploring and, and, and pushing our, our knowledge across the boundaries. And, and LRO, even though taking us back to the moon where we've been before, that there's a lot about our moon that we don't know. 
and, and a lot about our moon that we want to use as, as we begin to look out into the universe and decide you know, where we want to go next. So having a reconnaissance or a scout mission that, that, that begins to take us out is, is a perfect fit into what NASA is all about and what, what people like me who've dreamed about uh, working for NASA have always wanted to do, you know, explore, uh, look out beyond who and what we are today, and LRO is, is, is the perfect fit for that type of vision for all of us. Now that we know what to expect from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, we turn our attention to its sister payload, the Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite. Its goal is to hunt for evidence of water ice using a hard-hitting method. Dr. Kimberly Enico, LCROSS payload specialist, explains. LCROSS mission has two impact events. The first is the upper stage of the launch vehicle that we take with us on our four-month mission into space, um, and we separate from it, and um, it's traveling to hit the moon at 5,600 miles per hour. It's going to impact one of these lunar, permanently shadowed basins of a crater on the lunar pole. And it's going to hit a particular place. It's going to hit a place on the moon that we think there's water. Scientists who believe that there is water on the moon don't know whether it's smooth or chunky peanut butter type. So where you hit is important. The secondary impact is the um, L-cross payload, which will impact somewhere between three to five kilometers away from the first impact. So we're gonna hit another part of that crater. We've targeted this crater because it's got a strong hydrogen concentration. We're gonna sample two parts of this crater. And so the two impact events will tell us something about the distribution of this hydrogen concentration or perhaps a distribution of water, if the hydrogen is in water. The live images of our, what we're taking with our science payload as we're going into the surface for the last four minutes of the mission, which is 600 kilometers down to the surface, will be streamed live um, on a public channel. LCORS is important because it provides us a way to confirm the presence or absence of water ice at a particular location on the lunar pole. If there's water ice there, or water in some form, it means that for future missions to the moon and perhaps beyond, there's there an in situ, a resource that's there, a resource that's on the, on the surface of that planet. You don't need to bring it with you. So for the human species, in terms of exploring the rest of the solar system, so getting out, out of low Earth orbit, and we need water with us, if we can find a resource of water on the moon, that will be um, an, an amazing step forward and a great resource to take advantage of in a very resource-limited place. Both LRO and LCROSS need a successful launch in order to begin their missions. Our next guest is an integral part in getting these spacecraft and many others off the ground. Chuck Tatro is a mission manager in NASA's Launch Services Program at Kennedy Space Center. He's going to tell us about the unique challenges of this two-for-one launch. Hello, my name is Chuck Tatro and I'm a mission manager for NASA's Launch Service Program at Kennedy Space Center. We're at the Vertical Integration Facility on Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. This is where we will assemble the Atlas V rocket that will send the LRO and LCROSS spacecraft on their journey to the moon. As a mission manager, my job is to lead the effort to bring a new spacecraft and launch vehicle together to where they're ready to launch. About three months before launch, the spacecraft and the launch vehicle components arrive at the launch site for final testing. About two months before launch, the rocket components are erected on the mobile launch platform and filled with cryogenic fluids for a wet dress rehearsal. About two weeks before launch, the spacecraft is brought out here to the vertical integration facility and stacked on the rocket. At about one week before launch, we do a launch countdown rehearsal so the team can practice for countdown. In a dual payload flow, 
both spacecraft have their own intricate and intimate requirements that are separate and may not play together nicely with the other spacecraft. For, for example, contamination, orbital requirements. Because LCROSS is going to impact the moon and LRO is going to go in orbit around the moon, we need to make sure that one doesn't adversely impact the other. The first challenge on this mission is the fact that the Centaur second stage will remain attached to the LCROSS spacecraft after it does its normal job of delivering LRO and LCROSS on their journey to the moon. LCROSS then will command the Centaur stage for an impact into the lunar surface. The second challenge is that the orbit requirements for each spacecraft are complex. This narrows the daily launch window that we have to launch this mission. The third challenge is that this is NASA's first step in our return to the moon. So there's a lot of public awareness and increased interest in this mission. We want to make sure that this mission is launched safely and successfully. That's our show. To our guests, Kathy Petty, Dr. Kimberly Enico, and Chuck Tatro, thanks for giving us an insider's view of these two missions. We also thank all of you for joining us for today's webcast. Be sure to join us on launch day for the liftoff of the Atlas V rocket carrying the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and the Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite. You can follow the countdown on NASA TV and on each mission's website at www.nasa.gov slash LRO and www.nasa.gov slash LCROSS. From Kennedy Space Center in Florida, I'm George Diller.